This lesson is on chest trauma. And just like all of the trauma lessons, we're going to assume the primary survey has already been completed and any life-threatening injuries already addressed. Just like every other region in the chest, a patient can be stable or unstable. Unstable to the OR, stable to the CT scanner. Hemodynamic instability is an obvious one. But unlike other areas in the chest, unless there is a pericardial tamponade or a giant hemothorax taken care of in the primary survey, there aren't many things that indicate immediate movement to surgery. In fact, most of the pathologies can be treated with a chest tube. I'm going to start off with rib fractures and rib fracture complications and use that to talk about penetrating trauma as well as blunt. And then the second half of the lesson is what happens when you find hard evidence of severe trauma. Before we get there, let's start off with rib fractures. Rib fractures are the result of blunt trauma to the chest. When a rib fractures, the jagged edges on the fractured bone can lacerate blood vessels and alveoli. So blunt trauma to the chest causes rib fractures, becomes penetrating. And so I like to think of it as there being externally penetrating chest trauma, stab wounds, gunshots, because those are going to bring in atmosphere into the chest cavity. They can also lead to a sucking chest wound. Internally penetrating trauma, rib fractures, lacerates lung and blood vessels. The patient is going to present with a tender chest wall. It hurts. Palpation elicits pain, and it will be following chest trauma. In the trauma bay, the supine x-ray is often able to detect rib fractures, but only really on the lateral flanks. Getting a posterior has too many things in the way in terms of the x-ray. But to diagnose them, you are first going to use an x-ray And the best, of course, is a CT scan. CT scan is going to be bone window looking for the rib fractures. The CT scan also can look at the underlying lung parenchyma in the lung window. And often, if you find evidence of severe trauma, you're going to add an angiogram. We'll talk about that at the end. The angiogram is not necessary for the rib fractures, but it contributes to the, the overall picture. The treatment for rib fractures is that it depends. So here's what guidelines say, and this is going to be, of course, an oversimplification. I'm not going to get into the granular details. Some people you need to admit to the ICU. Some people need to be admitted, but not to the ICU, to med surge. The patients who need to be admitted to the ICU are those who are at the greatest risk for pneumonia. Having rib fractures means that it hurts to breathe. Big, deep breaths hurt more. Shallow breaths lead to atelectasis and eventual pneumonia. So those who are highest risk for developing pneumonia need to be brought into the hospital so that they don't die of pneumonia. Those who are at highest risk of dying and of acquiring pneumonia from rib fractures are those who are old, that is 65 and up, and have four or more rib fractures. The patient who should be admitted for observation are the elderly, over 65, or four or more rib fractures. Most patients with rib fractures do not need to be admitted. If they are admitted, they're gonna need pain control. There used to be a lot of discussion around balancing the pain of leading to shallow respirations with opioid treatment, taking away that pain so they breathe 
but the cost of respiratory depression. Opioids activate mu opioid receptors more and induce analgesia. Unfortunately, in this realm, epidural analgesia is the words that are used. But we do not use opioids if you're going to use an anesthetic, like lidocaine. Talk more about this in flail chest. And then whether or not open reduction and internal fixation is needed is individualized. You'll see how that's different in flail chest form. Most patients do not need to be admitted. So if the person is already ambulatory, that is they don't have another reason to be admitted and they're walking around, and they're able to perform their incentive spirometry goals, they can be discharged. And those who are discharged can be managed with a combination of NSAIDs and opioids. You do want them to take big deep breaths and it hurts to do so. These people who are usually younger, not so severely injured, injured and already have an ambulatory status can go home. Those who get admitted needed to be admitted to be for observation of pneumonia given incentive spirometry, told to walk around and control their pain well enough with an anesthetic, warn that in a minute. Rib fractures represent internal penetrating trauma. Penetrating trauma can lead to laceration of blood vessels, and that is going to cause a hemothorax. Hemothorax is caused by penetrating trauma, but because rib fractures count, Blunt trauma can cause it too. And a hemothorax is blood in the pleural space. The patient is going to present with decreased lung sounds, usually in, found in the primary survey. And because it's blood, not air, there's going to be dullness to percussion. That original supine x-ray may give you a clue, but it's not going to be clear. The reason for that is it's supine. Blood is fluid and going to layer out. If there is the person's on their back and the hematoma layers out to gravity, when the x-ray beams which are on the ceiling looking down, go through lung and blood, they see a sort of equal picture. Now, if there's no hem hemothorax on the other side, this side will look hazier. But when the person is upright, blood layers out. And so you'll get a horizontal meniscus. But you may not see that horizontal meniscus on the supine x-ray. And so in the setting of non-severe trauma, the first test would be an x-ray. And an upright x-ray would show a horizontal meniscus. What you're likely to actually find it with is during the primary survey, you do a FAST, which is an ultrasound, which finds fluid. The best test, not surprising, is the CT scan. Like most things in the chest, the initial treatment is a chest tube, a thoracostomy. If that thoracostomy results in 1,500 cc's of blood out in 24 hours, there used to be all at once and then per hour, 200, nope, 1,500 cc's in the first 24 hours. That is an arterial blood vessel rather than a pulmonary one. It's not going to stop on its own. This needs surgery. And usually this means thoracotomy. Cracking the chest to go looking for a blood vessel. In this arena, VATS, Video Assisted Thoracoscopic Surgery, Laparoscopic, basically, 
has gained ground, but Thor economy is going to be the answer on the test. Where VATS is going to be the right answer is in a retained hemothorax. You put the chest tube in, you get an x-ray to confirm placement, you begin drainage, connect it to water seal. In 24 hours, you repeat imaging. If it's still present, you do not do a second chest tube. That's not going to help. If it was in the right place, but it hasn't drained everything, you want to go in there and clear it out. But you don't need to crack the chest to do it because you're not going after a, a, a brisk bleeder. You want to clear out that stuff so it doesn't get infected. If the rib fracture lacerates a blood vessel, you get a hemothorax. If the rib fracture lacerates the alveolus, you end up with a pneumothorax. Pneumothorax is caused by penetrating trauma, but because rib fractures are internally penetrating trauma, blunt trauma can cause it too. And whereas pneumothorax was blood, pneumothorax is air in the pleural cavity. The patient is going to present with decreased lung sounds. And because it's air, not blood, there will be hyper-resonance. And that supine x-ray is going to show you a vertical lung shadow. Now, it's not exactly vertical, but comparing the two, the horizontal meniscus versus the vertical, this is how they're going to be able to describe pneumothorax from hemo. This is the portal cavity. The lung will be shrunk down, and it's the vertical lung shadow you're looking for. The diagnosis is made first with an x-ray. It does not need to be upright, and you're going to see a vertical shadow. You may have detected it on the primary survey of the FAST exam, and you'll see absent pleural slide. And of course, the best test is a CT scan. Like most pathologies in the chest, the treatment is with a chest tube. There are indications to go on to thoracotomy surgery, but this is less well defined or less easy to define for you when you do that. A significant air leak may require investigation. I want you to see that pneumothorax chest tube, hemothorax, chest tube. And some things that come up in other resources. As we talked about in the primary survey, needle decompression for a pneumothorax, that is for tension pneumothorax, is not done in the hospital. Surgeons put in chest tubes. And the three-sided occlusive dressing Now it's done for sucking chest wounds, not done in the hospital. Surgeons put in chest tubes. As a paramedic, I did do needle decompressions and I did three-sided occlusive dressings. But these are all pre-hospital interventions. I didn't know how and wasn't allowed to put in a chest tube. So I had these at my disposal instead. In the setting of a trauma bay, you do not perform these, you put in the chest tube. Now, rib fractures in general had this sort of admit if and ORIF individualized. A special kind of rib fracture is one of the pieces of hard evidence of severe chest trauma. Now, I've taken from the literature hard signs of etc., and I've used my own words, hard evidence of severe trauma. And one of those pieces of evidence of severe trauma is a flail chest. It is a rib fracture, but a special kind. A flail chest is going to occur when there are three or more rib levels affected, consecutive.
and they have to be broken in at least two places. When you do that, you've got a segment of the rib cage that is attached to each other by intercostals, but not to the rest of the chest wall. When the patient inhales, diaphragm pulls down. That's going to open the chest wall. The detached segment, it's only held together by muscles, is going to be pulled in by that inhalation. On exhalation, the rib cage is going to collapse and the flail segment will protrude outward. That's called paradoxical motion. That is pretty obvious to see. And you may have evidence of it with a supine chest x-ray showing multiple rib levels affected. But again, the supine x-ray only going to see the lateral fractures. There may be more in the posterior. So the diagnosis is made first with a chest x-ray. And then is a CT. What you're going to do is CT angio. Because you find flail chest, you're going to upgrade looking for blunt visceral injury. Everyone with a flail chest gets admitted to the ICU, is going to get an ORIF, open reduction internal fixation, and is going to get anesthesia. No opioids. Instead, what's the highest recommendation is an epidural. If you can't tolerate an epidural, you're going to go progressively out from the spinal cord, which is the epidural, to a paravertebral next to the vertebra. This is going to get the nerve roots. Intraplural is going to get some of the nerves that's in the pleural space. These are infusions, the best being epidural, because pain fibers, unmyelinated, low conduction velocity, you can knock out the pain fibers without knocking out the DCMLS or the corticospinal tract. If that doesn't work, you can get, get it local. where you get a nerve. These are all done with anesthetics like lidocaine, not analgesia like opioids. And what comes up on licensing exams a lot is because flail chest is hard evidence of severe trauma, if there is dyspnea, respiratory failure, in the setting of a flail chest, it's not the flail chest. but some blunt insert the chest viscera injury, either myocardial contusion or pulmonary contusion. So when you see a flail chest or other hard evidence of severe trauma, you have to consider these three diagnoses. I'm gonna start with blunt cardiac injury. Blunt cardiac injury is the new term used in guidelines. Back in the day, when I learned it, it was myocardial contusion. Being a myocardial contusion, the heart would be stunned, and so it acts a myocardial infarction. Not in the sense that there's rupture and thrombosis, in the sense that damaged myocardium does two things. It has ectomy, ectopy, so it prevents arrhythmias. And if you don't do anything about it long enough, you can end up with heart failure. Usually it's looking like a heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. The thing is, you don't have blunt cardiac injuries sneak up on you. What you're going to see is evidence 
of severe chest trauma.